We're live, brother. How you doing, man? Hey, pretty good. A couple of things, man. Um, you know, my, my I've done two semesters of school, four weeks apiece over the last two months. That ends tomorrow. I can focus strictly on on football, which is a good time, right? Because fall's here, uh, or or fall camp is here, so um, can focus on that until the twenty second, until my until my fall semester starts. So really, really excited about that. Um, and I think before you know it, we'll be down to single days leading up to 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 kickoff, man. So really exciting. It's nice to hear from the coach today. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, how you been, dude? I'm kind of tired, uh, but excited to do this tonight. Um, like I said, we're kind of going through. Uh, I know we got a couple of folks in here that listen to us that are that are know about the military and change of command. Sometimes can be a little, little bit busy, especially for an executive officer like myself. So my days start at five in the morning and generally don't end till eighteen hundred, and it's just grinding. Uh, but like you say, uh, the State of the Union happened today. The State of the Longhorns happened today. If you didn't feel like it was football. Uh, yesterday or the last couple of weeks, you definitely understand that the pads are going to come on real, real soon. You're going to start seeing the all access stuff on, on Longhorn Network. And like you said, next thing you know, it's going to be September 3rd. We're going to be lining up against ULM uh, to start the 2022 season. And I, I'm fired up for it. I think the biggest thing that, that you know, I think with Steve Sarkeesian coming from, from obviously uh, the great Nick Saban tree, um, I'm surprised he let his coaches talk because that's something he's really shied away from is letting his, you know, his, his coordinators talk uh, for, so for him to be able, you know, to, to have Kyle Flood there today and have, you know, Pete Kwiatkowski there today and then have uh, Jeff Banks there today uh, is, is something that I definitely didn't expect. I figured he would just probably come out and, you know, talk about, you know, probably injuries first and then get into to what they're going to expect in the fall and then take a whole bunch of questions from the Texas media, which they did. But it was really cool to get the insight from 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 all three of his coordinators, special teams and offense and defense, which, you know, they gave some really good answers. So, yeah, and, and that's what you want. You want to hear from everybody. You got a chance to hear from Steve Sarkeesian and a couple of players at Big 12 Media Days. Uh, but we talk about the defensive line uh, interior. Uh, Pete Kwiatkowski addressed it. Uh, we talk about, you know, the number of receivers they have on offense and weapons. Kyle Flood and Steve Sarkeesian talk about it. Uh, Jeff Banks gets an opportunity to talk about special teams. He's got two kickers that – three kickers on his roster he believes in can, can do well and talks about uh, bringing in another punter from from a walk-on stature. Uh, so, yeah, it's good to, to, to hear from the head man, but it's really nice to, to hear from the assistant coaches who are down there. Not that Steve Sarkeesian is not down there in the trenches with the defense – but that's Pete Kwiatkowski's gig. You know, that's what he does. And so that's what I want to hear him talk about, as, as somebody's already commented, setting the edge and not freelancing. And talking about specific players like the improvement of Byron Murphy, uh, stuff we're going to talk about later in the show. Uh, but but they can address those certain things that guys like us and guys in the media are talking about and asking about. Yeah. So let's start before we get into to really the press conferences from from each one of these individuals and kind of break it down. We'll go Steve Sarkeesian and then we'll go Kyle Flood and then we'll go Pete Kukowski and then and then Jeff Banks and we'll kind of see where the show takes us. Let's talk about recruiting real quick, man, because I, if you go to Texas boards and you go to Twitter, um, we, we here we go. Texas fans, guys, guys falling in the recruiting realm because you miss out on a guy like, you know, Colton Vasek to, to, you know, um, to Oklahoma. Then you're you're talking more than likely could probably going to lose Shelby to USC. Um, Hunter Osborne said, you know, rings over Lambos and decided to go to Alabama. Uh, in, in obviously linebacker and edge is something that we currently need on this roster, right? That we've seen uh, and to lose these guys. Uh, but I don't want to take away from what you already have and what you picked up in last class. And I know you want to talk a little bit about that, Jeremy, because I know me and you talked about it a little bit last night. Yeah, I mean, you, the 21 class consisted of Jamon Tapp, Justice Finkley, Derek Brown, uh, and Ethan Burke. And, and somebody was, you know, screenshotted that, snipped it out, and put it out there and said, you got, you know, four freshmen, uh, two with a 95 grade that are currently on the roster. And like you said, you, you want every good football player at the University of Texas, problem or at, in Texas, to go to Texas, especially kids who come from Austin Westlake. Again, you know, Sam Ellinger came from there. Connor Robertson came from there. Ethan Burke came from there. There's, there's been tons of Westlake kids that have come to, to Texas. But, and, and like you said, linebacker and edge is a position of need on this football team. But 
Colton Bassett didn't want to play for the Longhorns. You know, he had plenty of opportunities to, to go there. He got to hang out with Arch Manning a day before he went to Oklahoma. There was a reason he didn't want to play for the University of Texas, whether it be the defense last year, whether it be a, a spe- specific scheme, a specific coach, uh, didn't didn't like the degree program or opportunities at the University of Texas, wanted to get out of the city of Austin and go live his own life. Like, there's reasons why these kids don't pick Texas. And and like like I said, you'd like to have every good football player, especially in this state, go there. But guess what? You got 20, 28 scholarships generally per year, and there's a lot of good football players in the state of Texas. So you're not going to get everybody. Yes, this is a position of need, just like Anthony Hill going to A&M. Yes, you would love to have Anthony Hill. We talked about Anthony Hill about 10 times on this show. Uh, but Anthony Hill didn't want to come to Texas. So what do you do? You, you try to continue to recruit him because July's not signing day. Uh, December is. So you continue to recruit them, put a good product on the field, show them that they can fit in your scheme. And when December comes around, maybe you can flip them. But it just so, seems like June June was 2021. You know, you had a run of 13 commits in the month of June and July slowed down for you. Your, your rivals started picking up guys and it felt like you, that, that a year had passed. But no, you got 20 guys in this class. You still got four or five guys on the board that are, that are leans to Texas and this is not signing day. That's just how I feel about it. No, and, and, and so Wes is here. I don't think the sky's falling, but Texas does have a problem recruiting linebackers, and I won't say that they don't. Um, or top-tier linebackers. You know what I'm saying? Those those 95 and above linebackers. You, you really had a hard time getting those guys in. Uh, and, and, I don't, and I don't think it's so much the coaches. Let's, let's take that back because I'm going to tell you, uh, Dr. Finkley on Twitter the other day uh, expressed her opinion about this because somebody says, well, Co- Choate hasn't really – recruited anybody and, and, and she came back and said and, and had a picture of, of Finkley on there and said absolutely not uh he recruited this guy you know what I'm saying so I I, I and, and, gotta understand and I wasn't and, and, and let me take so I wasn't saying the coaches and his our coaches can't recruit he just might have a better relationship with the linebacker coach or the edge coach at Oklahoma you know it's not a discredit to our coaches to say that he wanted to play for somebody else um uh, it, like I said, like you said, Coach Choate and Coach Kwiatkowski, and like you said, Miss Finkley tweeted out. Uh, I think they got a pretty good one. And like you said, they she she screenshotted a picture of her son, which we know is a, a 95 grade. He's making a lot of hay, early enrollee. He, he's going to be uh, fighting for playing time in his freshman year. So yeah, I get it. But like I, I'm just trying to say, there may be other influences besides you know just. He doesn't want to play at Texas. Like I say, it might be a degree program. Might want to follow a girlfriend or has a friend up. I don't know. But he didn't. And you don't want football players that want, don't want to be here. You know what I mean? Especially with the transfer portal. If they're not all in and, and, and committed and then sign on signing day and, and waxing and waning, again, you want that if you could turn a guy like Anthony Hills and change his mind or flip or, or even Colton Bossett. Uh, but at this point in time, on July, whatever it was, yesterday, or I'm sorry, August, August 1st, he decided he wanted to commit to Oklahoma. So let me let me my, my thought is going towards what Scott's saying here. These blue chips athletes on the defense side of the ball need to see much improved product on the field. You're not going to have a hard time getting the offensive guys to get to the University of Texas. You're not at all zero because they know what Steve Sarkeesian can do from an offensive standpoint. So you, you got to think about it. Just like and I'm, I'm this is going to break some hearts here, right? Um, or it may upset some people, but the team out east, right? Texas AM, who's had a really, really good defensive, really good defense over the last couple of years in the SEC is able to get those defensive guys in Anthony Hill because they've been able to perform on the defense side of the ball. Opposite of that, right? A&M, top nine quarterbacks in the country. Top nine quarterbacks in the country is what they offered. They're sitting at zero. Novastad, who is a, a who is a parents went to Texas A&M, decided he wanted to stick with his commit to Baylor because Baylor's offensive coordinator, right? It, he thinks he has a better option of getting to the NFL because that offensive coordinator is sitting at Baylor. So he decided, I can't go over to Texas A&M where they, ran, they run, you know, an offense from 1985. You know, so they're going to be able to get those defensive guys because they've been able to prove it on the field. Opposite of Texas, where you're going to get all those offensive guys because you've been able to prove it on the field in Xavier Worthy and B. John Robinson and, and so on and so forth. So those defensive guys, until they see a product on the field where they, they say, okay, cool, I feel like, you know, I have an opportunity to, or I'm not going to say guys, I'm going to say those five-star defensive players. And who knows, you may get a Damian Wilson out of Florida, right? Uh, out of the blue. But most of these guys are going to commit where they feel like they have a better opportunity to, to make it to the NFL on their side of the ball. 
Same. Like, I, I don't know if A&M's proved it so much on the field as much as they have four or five-star defensive linemen. You know, talking about Levius Silverton, Gabriel Brown, Dendy, and I'm going to forget a couple because I don't follow their program like I follow the University of Texas. But like we talked to David Benda, linebackers like defensive linemen who could keep offensive guards and tackles off of them. So if you want to be able to roam and do your thing, you're going to go play behind a guy or guys that you think are, are high caliber. And, and that's the rationale. Just like you said, Ryan Niblett, Jonte Cook, possibly Jalen Hale, like want to play with the guy like Arch Manning. Like you said, they may get Cedric Baxter to be a weapon because we know the depth of the receiving core currently on the 40 acres. We know the depth of the running back position. We already covered it. And like you said, they're not going to have a problem. They scored 44 points per game last year in their wins, and I think it was 38 overall. Offense isn't going to be a problem to recruit to, but but you have a chance. And it starts September 3rd to put a good product on the field, on the defensive side of the ball, to show off the scheme, to show off how you can how you can better athletes can 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 excel. And that's how you're gonna turn the tide on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, and Isaac Darden, yeah, I'm not I'm not hearing it. The financial leverage and brand that we have all uh have all we need are guys that can sell. Uh, they can sell PK has the dope resume, but can't get these guys here. It's bigger than the product. I absolutely don't believe that. I believe that you, if you honestly, I don't give a damn if you're the, if you're the worst recruiter on earth. Right. And I recruited you know, as a head hunter, healthcare professionals. Right. And if you have something to sell them, I don't give a damn how bad of a recruiter you are. Right. How bad of a recruiter you are. That person is going to come work for you. If you give them options to be able to grow and produce and make money. And that's what it comes down to. So, and, and we've asked these, we've asked these, these, these athletes as they come on our show, what film do they show you? What film do they show you when you come there to provide something to, you know, to show them who you could be. And, and, and unfortunately, unfortunately, because we don't have any draft picks last year, Pete quickhouse has got to go back all the way to Washington to show guys that he drafted from Washington, not Texas. So how's the Texas kid going to look and say, okay, yeah, oh, I can go here where they get a whole bunch of draft picks in Alabama and Georgia and all these other places you're actually, you know, competing with for, 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 it's not like you're competing against no name teams for these players. You're competing against the Alabamas, the Georgias, the Texas A&Ms guys that are, that are play well. Go ahead, Jeremy. And I, I, don't, got a thought and I don't, and I don't know if Rod covered this on our show. I don't know if Rod covered this on the phone with me and Clint. Talking about Rod Babers, I don't know if Rod covered this on my drive home, but he said these athletes have to play the long game. NIL money, short three-year term of, of leverage, I guess that's the financial leverage he's talking about, is the NIL game. These guys want to get drafted. They're playing the long game. They don't, you know, $3 million a year from the University of Texas for, for three years is $9 million. You sign that first pro contract, to play in the NFL, I guarantee it's going to be a lot more $9 million guaranteed. And if you can go play with a team that that, that can, can, can showcase your skills and get you drafted, that's what you're going to go do if you're a student athlete. So financial leverage and NIL can get you so much uh, for a guy like that, that that's chasing NFL dreams, in my opinion. He could be talked off of that NIL deal and say, hey, yeah, you can go to Texas and you can get your one mil a year and drive a Lamborghini that you may have to get back after you're done there. Or you can come play behind this defensive line full of five stars and get drafted and then have long-term financial rewards. That's just my thought. So we got our first troll in here tonight, uh, Mr. Roger Oakwin. I just don't think Arts will end up coming to Texas. That's probably the hardest – probably the hottest take we've, we, we've seen over the last two months. We've done a lot of shows um, he has too much deep south in him, Tennessee, Ole Miss, and they're winning now. Uh, uh, Arch is not going to decommit from the University of Texas. So appreciate your hot take here, um, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. He doesn't believe that. He wrote it, but he doesn't believe that. Uh, Tennessee and Ole Miss aren't even on, on his radar. <laughs> All right. So so we covered recruiting, right? I, I think I think that's that's the piece that that's frustrating is everybody thinks just because you have a burn orange helmet or or you wear the icy whites in road games or you have this tradition that's not really had been a tradition for the last 10 years, the kids are just supposed to say, Yep, it's Texas, I'm going. And, and the kids that we talk to that have been on our show say that. They do believe that, that Sark is they believe Sark's vision, they believe this program is on the up and coming. 
and, and they discount that five and seven, seven record and say, I'm all in. But there's going to be guys out there that don't don't buy that vision. They, they, they haven't seen it on the field. But, but you can get those guys back. Like I say, it goes hand in hand. Uh, the product, the degrees, the NIL, the, 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 the scheme fit, but it has to manifest in wins to truly develop this program to where we talked about the Alabamas are, where you got five-star playing behind five-star playing behind five-star because they just want an opportunity to win championships and get drafted. It's rings over Lambos. It's seriously again yeah. those Lambos look 100%. pretty when you're out there taking a picture with it. But it, what can can you win a championship? Can you again on the defense side of the ball? You're talking about Nick Saban, man. Guys, that, that, his secondary guys, hell, all of his defensive guys are making it to the NFL. Uh, he turns wide so, receivers into defenders and puts them in the NFL. Trayvon okay. Diggs. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about uh, Jazz Superman. Uh, PK's defense didn't make any of our players better last year. Everyone regressed. We had a five-star guy. We had five-star guys leaving our program, the portal. Uh, the only five-star guys that I can think of off the top of my head that went in the portal are now at uh, Sam, Houston State. Sam Houston State University, that the actual school that I'm going to right now. Uh, and I would have believed they regressed prior to PK getting there. Uh, just my thoughts. Uh, yeah, injuries. So, again, injuries, a whole lot, a host of things were going on. I, I don't think deep – I don't think PK – defense caused any of these guys to regress and we'll get into some thoughts man we'll get thoughts behind steve sarkeesian um you know jeff banks pete kowski and, and and kyle flood pretty quick quick on this on this these press conferences this is fiery i i, I like the energy coming out of this show positive and negative um haven't really looked at the comments i know you're flipping through them uh because you got a lot of notes here that you want to go through but but i i really enjoy this feels like in season post game type top talk like they didn't do well on fourth down and three from this or they did fantastic in these explosive plays like i'm really really fired up for the season i, I think the fans are uh and, and it's just it can't get here soon enough and we really appreciate you joining us tonight on this tuesday night so isaac darden here uh but hold up just just said a m didn't produce to get who they got no, I said they did produce. They produce a defensive. They they produced defensively in the SEC. They have, and they've gotten guys to the NFL. Probably not at the level of what I think they. Uh, who's the guy out of Converse? Can't even think of his name right now. Uh, who was supposed to go in the first round? I think he flipped back to to the second round. They think Antonio Johnson is like the number one safety in the country for them. Uh, so they're producing defensive guys, and they're going to be able to. And like you know, they're going to be able to to produce. Or they're going to be able to grab guys because of what they've been able to do on the field on the on the defensive side of the ball. They, I think they lost four games, three games with a backup with a backup you know quarterback last year, and their defense is the only thing that carried them through those games. So obviously, defensive recruits want to go play in 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 at, at, with that team out east. Offensive guys want to come play for Sarkeesian here. It's just flipped. And, but to, until you show that you can put a productive defense together on the field, it's going to be hard to get those. Guys to want to come to Texas. I, Isaac picks and chooses what he wants to address, right? Because he's saying he can't disagree with us with NIL because I probably said guys don't necessarily look at NIL. There are some student athletes who come to the University of Texas to get paid. I understand that. But there's also other athletes who play the long game and don't necessarily jump at the bag. You know, that they, they're looking to get drafted and, and they got to weigh their options. Uh, and, and like I said, I, I'll credit Rod Babers for, for pointing this out. That, that, that he knows that people that advise these student athletes, and he's a heck of a lot pro, closer to the program than myself and Isaac and you, I guarantee you that, uh, because he gets invited into, into the locker room. We don't. Um, he believes that, that there's certain student athletes out there that aren't playing the short game, not looking for the bag right now, but make their decisions based upon NFL draft status. And I agree with him. So, like I said, yeah. I just think he picks a little bit of what we say and, and chooses to, 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 to write his own narrative. This has it's, this is good tonight. Uh, I like it. J, J.S. Hooper Coburn was supposed to be an anchor. College didn't develop. Uh, Demo didn't look comfortable. Foster quit halfway through the season. Yet stayed on the field again. This is what happens when you change schemes three years in a row. You've had three different coordinators trying to learn. You got, you know, and I think that's frustration. It's frustration on kids. And I explained it to to, to David Benda like this, right? Because we actually talked to David Benda uh, a couple of Saturday nights ago specifically about this, right? No, actually, I talked to Anthony Cook about it. This is who I had that conversation with, right? It was Anthony Cook, who was from that 2018 class. And we're like, how do you handle, how do, how do you handle changing, you know, 
defensive coordinator after defensive coordinator after defensive coordinator, he looked at it as a positive. His positive was, you know what, I, it prepares me in all kinds of schemes now. So I think Anthony Cook did it right. But when you're looking at changing your head coach or your defensive, your defensive coordinator year after year after year, you're not just changing scheme. You're changing leadership personalities as well. And you're changing – you know, the 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 cohesion that you have with those uh, position coaches. Bo Davis might have been totally different than the last defensive line coach. Choke may be different than the last linebacker coach. Um, so I, I think it has to do a lot with that. I think what you'll see this year is they're going to be comfortable in the scheme. Uh, we'll see where it goes, uh, especially with Marvin and Overshone and how they're going to move him around. We'll see where Collins lines up. Collins – Again, you get sometimes, you get no times. Sometimes, no times. Uh, can it be consistent play? And, and and that's what they talked a lot about at the press conference today. It's not. It's about putting the best guys out there, but who's going to be consistent? So that if we have to flip a coin, right? I don't want to be able to flip a coin. Is he going to be able to, you know, stop the defensive end? This player is he not going to be able to stop the defensive play? They want consistency where they know that ninety percent of the time when they go out there and put them on the field, they're going to make a play versus taking a play off or or not making a play at all. Yeah, totally agree. Um, and, and that's kind of what I was saying the other day about starters. You know, he's the guy that's listed on the depth chart on Tuesday, you know, and, and he goes out for the first snap of the game. But I'm looking for the guys that play in the third and fourth quarter um, to, to to find out who the coaches really, really trust. And 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 that needs to change. If that if that's a deal where we're starting guy, and I don't believe it is, but we're starting not the best players, uh, give that guy that, that that's earned that that – position in the depth chart that 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 walk out on the field in the first play again it's driven by by alignment it's dri driven by personnel groups it's driven by whatever the heck the the offense wants to throw on the field versus the defense and vice versa on the other side of the football but but yeah I'm looking I'm I just need more consistency and they talked about that and, and if we could get to one comment I think that yeah. Wikowski said today about the the edges right the guy that was responsible for setting the edges, whether he plays Jack, whether he plays Buck, whether he's an outside linebacker, whether he's a safety, or he's a corner coming down on a blitz. Like, those guys have to do their job. Like, no freelancing. Like, if we're going to play the scheme, let's play the scheme. Like, because if you're not doing your job, it affects another man. Uh, so that that's what has to be done, too, is 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 the freelancing has to go. I, I understand we got great athletes, and that stuff worked in high school because you were better than the guy that lined up and probably better than every athlete on the other side of the football, and freelancing worked. Uh, just like we, we were going to talk about, you know, just an outside rush versus, you know, a, a bull rush and having a second move or, or, or a counter uh, because he said he's got plenty of edges off the speed. He, he needs power guys like a Justice Finkley. Um, but, yeah, just do your job. That that's that's number one. And that's when you talk about consistency and and, and and trust out of your football players. Just know that that what they're supposed to do on an individual play, they execute. Now, if they get busted, they get busted. Because it, it, because athlete on athlete, they just got beat. They got blocked. They didn't make you know. But but I want you to put yourself in a position to make plays and, and make tackles. So go so quick, Kowski, talking about watching Murphy not start last year was kind of exhausting. And I'm gonna tell you, we're big Byron Murphy fans. I'm a big hey. Um, if the season was to start today, it wouldn't surprise me if Byron Murphy wasn't going out there first with the with the first team defense. And Kwiatkowski said it today. I think one of the strengths of our defense is going to be our interior lineman, and he not named Byron Murphy first. So um, again, to me, that's your dude. Uh, you know, in the interior, to me, he probably has the the higher trajectory of anybody currently there um, that's playing on the interior. To me. Uh, especially from the nose tackle. Uh, we'll kind of see where Alfred Collins plays this year. I think he's going to play the three. Is that correct, Jeremy? Um, yeah. So, yeah, he played the three. So, if Alfred Collins does Alfred Collins things like we've seen, you know, before with the one-handed interception and some of the plays he's made behind the behind the, the line, and then you get a guy like Byron Murphy that, that – has play, been playing off the charts, and all the coaches do is talk about Byron Murphy and Byron Murphy and Byron Murphy and more Byron Murphy. <laughs> I think this defensive line could be really good because they all talk about Byron Murphy. There's not one coach that has not said anything about Byron Murphy. I, I think I missed your. I think I missed your question because I was reading a comment. Uh, you asked me was Alfred Collins playing the three? Yeah, and, and I said yes, but the answer is no. Like he wasn't. He's was playing defensive end. Where I would like to see him play to take the advantage of what I believe is his skill set is move him to the three technique. Uh, quick twitch, huge, 
can, can push the pocket from the interior like he did his freshman. He played inside his freshman year, and then they moved him outside last year. I think he I think he wreaks more, most havoc in the middle. So that's that's what I uh, – I, I see. That's the comment I was reading that I got a little sidetracked, and, and I and I didn't mean to come at you like that, Isaac. It's just passionate guys talking talking ball. But that's our frustration is that we believe we got a lot of good football players in the 2021 class, and there's still good football players left to go in the 2022 class. We missed on two guys that that Anthony Hill that could have contributed to this football team, Colton Voss that could have contributed to this football team. But it's not signing day. That's all we're trying to say. It's not December. Names haven't been put on the on the dotted line. Go out. Make this defense better. Show these kids in the 2022 class on the defensive side of the ball that you can produce draft picks, and I think that changes. That would be the narrative, to 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 use the word that I use and you used against me. That would be the narrative that 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 because again, if PK's got to show film to to student athletes from Washington to to show what an what a what an NFL football player looks like, it's not a good look. Like, but he's only been here for one year, so. Let's produce those kind of guys. Let's let's get these guys at a level that they don't think they can achieve themselves. Get them to the NFL, and it'll be an easier sell. Because again, the University of Texas can only sell so much uh, without without proof on the football field. That's, that's uh, again, cool. I, I think ninety percent of our conversation between now and, and September third is going to be defense related. One hundred percent, I think it's going to be defense related because I think that is where everybody's concern is. It's probably the offensive line. And we'll get to Kyle Flood's conversation, or really a couple of questions that 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 both Sark and Kyle Flood took on the offensive line. We'll get to those in a minute because I think they're important. But I think this defense, this defense is really what it, it, eyes are all going to be on the defense, and the reason is is because the way I don't think it can be worse than what it was last year. Honestly, it, it, your your defense was terrible, and, and I say that if you get somewhere somewhere in in, in average defense, somewhere probably between fifty and 50 and 70, your your offense is gonna be able to score enough points to 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 win most games. But I, yep. I definitely understand everybody's passion about this defense because it was a disaster last year and it can't get any worse, you would hope. That and that's so. your question mark. That is definitely the question mark going into the season. You're when you look at the offense and the weapons they have with Roshan, Bijan, yeah, yeah, the same thing about the offensive line. You hope. A much improved offensive line, but you look outside and you got Nair, Worthy, Whittington, Ajah Hall, Brennan Thompson, just boatload of receivers. And I and I'm sure I missed one because you know we just always miss one. But there's not a whole lot of worry there, right? So you, you don't take it for granted, but you take it for granted, right? You'd be shocked if against ULM they didn't move the football up and down the field consistently, even with a new quarterback, whether it be Hudson Carter, Quinn Ewers, and and, and an unsure offensive line. Get the ball out of your hands. Get it to your weapons. Let the weapons make explosive plays, and, and you're on your way to 40 points. It, it's the reason we're talking defense is because that's the part that has to show up. That's the question mark. That's the guessing game. That's that's what is the what is this fall camp going to do? It's going to provide us a starting quarterback, and it's going to tell us where this defense stands. Because again, like you said, I expect to see that. That's why we did offensive player previews first. We did the easy ones that we thought we already knew. We're holding off on the defense because we have no idea. We want to see some attrition. We want to see guys who don't play well lose their jobs. We want to see guys who didn't play well last year improve and, and, and be on the on the twenty two deep or the two deep for a reason. That that's why the defense is getting brought up. And I and I absolutely love defense. So we could talk defense all night. Okay, so we're gonna actually we're gonna talk, we're gonna talk offensive line real quick. We're gonna get all right, defense. Let's do offensive, we're gonna talk line. offensive line. All right, so offensive line. One of uh, Flood's comments today, and I think it's absolutely important because we talk about best five players, right? So Flood said, uh, we got production. We got to get production out of the room. Ultimately, will that mean some of the freshmen will play? Question mark. As I tell my players, I tell every recruit, the best five players are going to play, and ultimately where they play will be determined by the who the best five are. And that's where we talk about, you know what, it doesn't matter if if if, if, if uh, Hayden Connor played right guard, right guard or if he played left tackle. Uh, I think right now, I think they had Cole Hudson, DJ Campbell, and Connor Robertson all taking snaps at center just recently. Over the last 16 you. days, over the last 16 you. days, go ahead. No, you could get 80% of the guys right. Like, you could throw out your starting five, and we asked you to do that in the offensive line position preview. Like, throw your five out there. You could be 80% right going left to right on the personnel and be 20% right on their alignment. That, that's like I said. I believe they're going to play the best five, and they're going to play the best five at their best position. And however that makes out, it makes out. 
I was just surprised of the the carrot on Galal Jones leadership comment. That 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 makes me think that he's he hasn't decided, but I really feel like there's going to be you're not. I, I think somebody left a comment in there that wouldn't be surprised if five freshmen on the offensive line by the end of the year. I don't see that happening. Uh, my ratio, I think, was 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 four and one to start the season and three and two pretty quickly. Uh, but again, it's a guess. It's it's a hundred percent a guess. You you think you know? Uh, like I said, we could get eighty percent, four out of five correct as far as personnel, and have the positions completely wrong. Yeah. So somebody said there's 105 people in here watching right now, and we're really bad about this. Me and Jeremy will get going, and we we won't say anything about like and subscribe and all these other things. We're really terrible about it. Um, so I'm gonna pause real quick when we do see that there's 100 and 100 people in here right now. 38 likes. If you would not mind, hit that like button. We greatly appreciate it. If you have not subscribed to our channel, I can tell you that me and Jeremy hit 3,600 subscribers, I think. Uh, and Jeremy called me the other night. He said, he said, do you think it's possible to get to, to 4,000 subscribers by the first game? Uh, we would have to have a lot of subscribers between now, today, and in and, and September 3rd. So, hey, if you have not subscribed, please hit that, hit that subscribe channel. It'll be one one closer subscriber to 4,000 before we hit the – before it's, we hit the season. But it's but it's really easy math, right? It's August the 2nd. Opening day is September the 3rd. It's 100 subscribers per week from here on out. And, and we're delivering a lot of content. Um, like, we're, we're, we've got a collaboration coming up, and I could say it because they're locked in. Not specific dates, but with Nino's Corner is going to come on this month. Uh, Fanatic Perspective is going to come on this month. I uh, reached out to a couple of parents, the current Longhorns. We're going to have a parents roundtable talking about, you know, being the parent of a D1 athlete going through the recruiting process and once they get on campus. Uh, so we're delivering a ton of comment content. So please hit the like button so other folks who don't know about Texas Football Talk have the opportunity to see our videos. And please subscribe to our channel. Again, we're, 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 we're not at athletes anymore, but we're still competitive people. So that's what drives us. We have goals, and we'd like to reach those goals. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything to hit the thumbs up. Doesn't cost you anything to subscribe. And think about joining our inner circle. It provides you extra content and really cool emojis. So, yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah. So, so let's get back to this the, uh, offensive line conversation again. It was a question that was asked of of Steve Sarkeesian. Let me find it here, and, and we'll get to quarterbacks, and, and we'll get to some of this stuff here in a few minutes. But I was, where is that com? Where that comment at? Where they say, okay, Sarkeesian at, uh, was asked if he needs Kelvin Banks to win the starting job. Steve Sarkeesian said, not a great question. The reality is we need all of our guys to play at a high level. Uh, crazy question. I don't know who the hell would ask that question, right? You know, and, and it's funny because Steve Sarkeesian said, that's absolutely ridiculous, right? You're asking me about a, fr a, a, a freshman that's been in a shirt, a t shirt and shorts for 16 practices about needing him to start. And he was like, you know what? If I was to say that, hey, you're putting a lot of you're putting a lot of, you know, pressure on on one kid. That's one, and then you're sliding 17 other dudes to the right, meaning you're not giving them an opportunity to play, which goes against that. Hey, the fi best five will play. Do I think Kelvin Banks has a good shot at being left tackle? We, if you went and watched our offensive preview, uh, I think we both have him as our offensive tackle, left our left tackle uh, starting uh, the first game. So we we believe it's that way. But for someone to ask Steve Sarkeesian if if Kelvin Banks he needed Kelvin Banks to win that left tackle position was one of the craziest questions I've, and, I've ever heard and, from and, a media guy. And you and you love Kelvin Banks coming out of Summer Creek again. He was a top ten player in the country, and you knew him and DJ Campbell and and Cole. Like I said, when we wrote that thing, we knew I I, I didn't realize the number of accolades that all seven of them had uh, when you started writing it. Um, but when you looked at – when you talked to the players on that Saturday night for the Burn Orange Heroes and you got the response that you got from them about Kelvin Banks, they weren't talking about a freshman. They were talking about a football player that could help their football team. That's the way I kind of looked at it. And that's when me and you kind of walked away thinking, hey, he's got a legit shot to be the left tackle. And, 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 if, and if he could carry over what he's been doing in the summer and fall when the pads come on, because Scott Flood said it today, I don't pick linemen. Uh, in shorts and t-shirts i pick lima once the pads come on we've always said that like that that's what it's going to happen is when they start moving guys off the off the ball in scrimmages uh in live action but but like i say the look look on their faces more than what they told us told me that they look at him as is as a different human being as a different kind of like i say a difference maker regardless of classification and if that's the case then guess what he's gonna he's gonna play ball yeah. So next one I want to talk about. Let's go. Let's go to the defense side of the ball real quick. Uh, P 
Pete Kwiatkowski talking about Gary Patterson here. Um, he's a resource to me and all of our coaches. He's been in the conference for 20-something years. He has the lay of the land in the state of Texas, so there's a lot of info uh, that he has brought to the table that's been, been valuable. And again, in order to be, I'm gonna tell you, in order to to, to be great, you got to surround yourself with. You got in order to be great, you got to surround yourself with great people. And I think, and we've talked about this before, going out and getting Gary Patterson is is a defensive guy, and having him come in and 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 you know be able to look at both sides of the ball, what Steve Sarkeesian's doing on the offensive side of the ball, and tell him, hey, you know what, this is your tendencies, and then looking at the defense side of the ball and says, hey. Uh, you know, you have you you got Anthony Cook playing at the nickel, but I think he's a true safety. Or I think you've got, uh, you know, uh, let's take uh, Jamison. It, it, uh, that'd probably be a bad one. You know, uh, but be able to move around those pieces. Like, hey, but let's bring DeMarvin Overshone, who we think may have a pass rush ability around the line. You know, I, I think he has a lot of conversations with him about that because he knows player personnel. He knows, you know, how to identify where – the strengths of these players and where to pl play them on Saturdays. And that's why a lot of his guys went on to the NFL, uh, you know, that don't have the stars, the guys that the University of Texas have. That was the point I was going to make. The guys that that generally don't end up on Texas commitment list and their signing day list, the guys that Texas didn't offer scholarship to, he was able to mold and, like you say, put them in positions of strength uh, to allow them to, to, one, make his defensive unit better, because TCU's defense was always very good, and then ultimately get them drafted. Uh, like you, you used the example of, of Cook, who's played, like I say, slot boundary, field corner, and now he's moving back to free safety. Keaton Crawford, a guy who's a corner, looking to go back to safety. Uh, position versatility is a must. Uh, and like you said, if it takes a guy like Gary Patterson, who's been doing this for a long, long time, especially against this same conference, like he knows how this conference operates. He knows all these – not all the offensive coordinators because there's plenty of movement within the conference as far as offensive coordinators this year, uh, but understands the conference, how it works, and, and, and can develop, help get, help Pete Wachowski develop a game plan, and like you said, scout against Steve Sarkeesian. Like like you say, play the devil's advocate. Hey, Sark, your first 15 scripted plays get us out to 14-point leads, but what happens after that? What mm -hmm. if they do this to counter? What is your counter? Uh is 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 what he's brought in here to do and like i mean Pete quick get it he, he's there to help everybody not just him but if he can help blake gideon be a little bit better safety coach that's awesome he can help yeah. Terry joseph a little you know just just give them nuggets to help them be better football coaches that, that translates to to play on the field and i think what steve sarkeesian said it today he said we were terrible at making adjustments we were terrible we would get up on teams, man. We'd be up 14, you know, 14, 21, 28 points on teams. It would be halftime, and then something bad would happen. And then all of a sudden, it's like a it's a disaster hit. We couldn't make the adjustments we needed to, and then everybody's playing out of place. Um, and I think that he won't be on a headset. He can't be on a headset, but there's nothing to say he can't slide a card over to Pete Kwiatkowski in the freaking press box that says, hey, by the way, I, I think you should run this because this is the tendency they keep running. Or, hey, you know, this is what we need to do in the second half because I think this is the way they're going to – you've stopped this in the first half. They're probably going to go to something in the second half. You probably need to be aware of this. There's nothing wrong with that. Obviously he can't be a headset guy, but I'll pass me all the cards you want to across the thing, you know, and I think that's where he's going to be at because he can sit up in that press box and get watch and he can be comfortable. Somebody said it best, man. GP is enjoying Sixth street, right? He's probably got the easiest job he's had in 20 years. He's watching film. He's advising coaches on both the defense and offensive staffs. And he has an opportunity to still be around probably you know, that age of kid that he likes to be around to help recruit and then help this team adjust when it's time to adjust on Saturdays. I think it's absolutely in his wheelhouse. I see yeah, him sticking around for a couple of years. I really do see free. Him. Yep. Yeah, not stress-free, but less stress. You know, he's still getting paid by the University of Texas, so they're, they're asking him to do certain things for them uh, to benefit their program. But, but he's not having to, you know, go to these media – engagements every week he's not to stand out there and do that he could just be a football coach being be an analyst guy be be a guy like you said that, that steve sarkeesian pete Kwiatkowski, or any of the position coaches could come to and, and, and give them tidbits on player personnel or or scheme i dig it and yes he's definitely about sweat. <laughs> go ahead I don't know if he'll sweat or not, man. He he may he probably gonna be at a press conference. The reason for he probably he's not gonna be on the field, guy. You know I don't think he could be down down on the field. You know because they can only have so many coaches on the field. He's gonna be at a press box. He may be wearing a hoodie. You know who knows? Um, but hopefully he's not sweating as bad as what he sweated on the field as he is in the press box. That would be a problem. You know, but who I bet knows? he gets. Maybe, I, 
I guarantee you, I bet he gets found by the cameras at least three or four times a game with Garrison, former TCU coach and, and Texas analyst. He'll definitely be found by the cameras, whether it's ESPN, Fox, or whatever uh, they'll channel find him. we're playing on that day. They'll, yeah, they'll definitely find him. We'll, we'll be able to tell if he's sweating or not. All right, something we don't talk about enough, right? And, 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 and sometimes people will bring it up. Uh, it's – Let's talk about the kicking situation because I think it's I think it's real at this point. All right, so Banks talked about Bird or, uh, Auburn and Will Stone uh, would be the two guys who complete uh, compete for field goals and kickoff jobs. We have another player, uh, Gabriel Lozano, who transferred from Texas Tech, who provides some really good stability there. Um, he feels good. We have three legs that I they have confidence in, but the problem is they don't have that much confidence because they said they're going to look at down and distance to decide if they want these field goal kickers to go out and kick field goals because they've never kicked field goals in front of 100,000 fans before. So it changes your offense in the way that you think because they're, they they don't have enough confidence in them. They, they specifically said that. You have to look at, do I go for it on fourth and six, you know, close to the red zone, or do I send a kicker out there that we don't have enough confidence in, you know, to be able to get us three points? And that's where you're at because you've been able to lean on Dicker the kicker for, you know, three years in his consistency. Now you're in a place where – Brand new punter, brand new kickoff guy, and a brand new field goal guy. It's a place we haven't been yeah. in a long time. Yeah, because he was so consistent, and he had he had to do all three. He did all three, and, and and I, I just hope we get deep down, far enough down in field position where they're kicking short field. I don't want to. I don't want to have to kick any field goals. To be honest with you, <laughs> as a Texas Longhorn fan and knows the potential of this offense. I don't. I don't want to be at fourth in anything this year. I know it's going to happen, uh, but teams are going to have a hard time stopping this offense, and, and they're going to have a hard. They they may have, as the field shrinks a little bit, may even have a harder time uh, stopping this offense. When, when we're talking about Jatavian Sanders, I watched a lot of Jatavian Sanders film last night, getting ready for the tight end uh, show, and if him and Billingsley could be what I think they could be. That that's that's a hell of a threat, and then like I say, you got a guy like Isaiah Nair who's six three, two hundred fifteen pounds. You got a guy like Troy O'Meara if he's healthy, is your fourth fifth receiver at six three, two hundred fifteen pounds. You got options down there, and you can always get Bijan the ball. Twenty five touches. I take that back. If 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 D Train is still in here, uh, I should have changed the tweet from twenty five carries to twenty five touches. What I was trying to say is he got seven carries or seven touches as a freshman. Uh, 16 touches as a sophomore. That's got to be. That's got to be up to 25. Uh, whether it's in passing or receiving or, or rushing, I need. I need Bijan to touch the ball 25 times. Roshan to get it 10 to 15, and then, like I say, use Keelan. Uh, have Jonathan Brooks out there. But I, I just like a running back who's in a groove, who, who's who's felt contact, who 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 understands uh, the game plan um, to, to touch the ball a little bit. So. Uh, I take the 25 carry tweet back. I meant to say I sh- if I had a chance to rewrite it, but you can't edit on tweets unless you pay some money. Um, it should have probably put 25 touches. Yeah. So, so Keelan Robinson, I think Bakes put out today that he that he actually gained 12 to 13 pounds. They put 12 to 13 pounds on Keelan Robinson. We actually seen him last Saturday, and he he's 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 not a tiny guy, man. He's really mm-hmm. not. It's funny because me and Jeremy were looking at these guys, and Jeremy, what are you like five eleven? You like five yeah, eleven? Five eleven, one ninety five. Yeah, five eleven, and, and you walk up to a guy like Cook, where it says he's like six foot, but then you look at him and he and he, and he looks like he's like six foot two, right? Um, mm-hmm. And it's what most of these guys, you know. Uh, here we go, here we go. Question: Do you take some of the blue chip freshmen and feed them to the lines for game for game development? Absolutely, absolutely, one hundred percent. As long as they're game ready and they're best, they're the best available player on the football team. I don't think that you're going to throw a true freshman out there if he's not the best available player. But I think if they're the best available player, like we've talked before, and you in in it, we'll just use offensive line. If at the end of fall, this is going to sound crazy, but at the end of fall, if DJ Campbell, who's been practicing at center, right, which he's not going to take Jake, Jake Major spot, I just don't see it happening because again, there's a lot of things that are happening as a center. But let's take that for an example, right? That that DJ Campbell is playing center. Uh, you got Cole Hudson that's playing guard, and you got Kelvin Banks playing left tackle. If those are the best three guys at those positions. Absolutely, you throw them to the wolves. What, what are you going to do? If and I think Steve Steve Sarkeesian said it best today. They asked if it all things equal, right? All things equal, and you have a guy that's just came in that's a true freshman, and you have guys that's been on the forty acres for three or four years, and they're equal, right? 
how do you determine which guy you're going to start? He says, based on trajectory. And I talked about this, right? So if if you have a guy like, if you have a guy, Christian Jones, right? He's been around for a long time and he's met his ceiling and they know that's where his ceiling is and they don't think that he's going to get any better through the season. Why would you start Christian Jones over Kelvin Banks when you know his trajectory is going to get, his trajectory is higher and he's going to get better over the season and you got him for another three years? Why wouldn't you? Never, and, never even thought about it like that. Never even yep. thought about it like that. that uh, that's kind of brilliant because if, if, like you said, if you think game reps can help a guy reach a certain level and, and the other guy can't, then yeah, by all means, like if, if experience is what you think he needs to, to get him to a better level than the guy he's competing against and they're even, then I, I never even looked at it like that. I, I would have thought you'd have picked experience over over young when you're talking about same, you know, level, but that makes a ton of sense now, now that you said it like that. And there's a couple of couple of comments up here that I want to throw up here real quick on the defense because because they really interest me and I and I and I agree with them for the most part. Uh, I think we actually have our edge guys on the roster, Ethan Burke and and, and Derek Brown. Uh, should redshirt this year and try to get bigger, and we should should be in good shape. Yeah, I think the guys that are going to see significant playing time out of the freshman defense bins are the guys we talked about earlier, Jamon Tapp and Justice Finkley. I think you do. I think Ethan Burke could get some run, uh, but I, I agree with you on on Derek Brown. I think he needs to to get a little bit heavier, uh, or or you, or you think about moving him to a different position. And then I wanted to throw this one up because this is a guy I really really like, Jalen Gilbo. Uh, yeah, he's back with the team. And him and Ibrahim are back with the team. And this is the one I want to pull up. Gilbo over Jameson. If, if, if Texas defense wants to do the things that Rod Babers talked about last Monday, and that's have a dominant pass rusher and a dominant shutdown right. corner. And he talked about physical, right? I've not seen a, a kid in a long time. When I watched Jalen Gilbo, now I've since went back and watched Malik Muhammad, I think he's as physical. But when I watch Jalen Gilbo's film from Port Arthur Memorial, he is dominant at the line of scrimmage. When he gets his hand on you, you're not going to go anywhere. So I like his physicality. I like the way he plays ball. And, and if that's the kind of defense we're, we're looking to, to start with, is a, is, a, is a jam in your face, cornerback, we're, gonna, we're not going to give you uh, any cushion. We're going to be up in your face and hitting you at the line of scrimmage. Jalen Gilbo is the prototype for that. So, so again, Steve Sarkeesian brought this up today, and he says, "You want to talk about defensive scheme and how we're going to how we're going to change the defensive scheme? Press man coverage, press man coverage, press man coverage. You can't expect a a a, def, a, a, a pass rush if you got a quarterback that's going to sit back there. He's going to take a three step drop and he's throwing the ball out of his hand. If you cannot play press man coverage, they're going to complete those passes because you don't have enough time to get to them." Uh, and it was funny because Malik Muhammad came up when Jeremy was talking about Jalen Gilbo because we we I think the same thing I think I think Gilbo is currently playing I think behind Jade Barron at the nickel but I think he was also backing up Jamison at the corner position going into the spring and then I think he got in the doghouse and then now he's out of the doghouse but I think they said he's the best cornerback that made it through the summer um, so I think there's an opportunity for him to play. Again, play your best five guys. I don't care if you've been there forever. There's plenty of spots that Jameson can play. He can play on special teams, lots of special teams. He can give you all the special teams you need. But if, if yeah. but if but if if Jalen Gilbo is better than Jameson in the scheme that they want to run, then you have to start Jalen Gilbo. You have to. Uh, somebody was talking uh, about Malik Muhammad the other day, and they, I don't remember who, who put it out there. I think it was on a tweet, um, and I wish I could remember who it is because I, I love giving people credit. Uh, but they were talking about Malik Muhammad and how he how he's a, as physical as a cornerback as what you would see in a linebacker. And I think it was – I can't remember off the top of my head who it was. But I think you see the same thing in Jalen Gilbo. And that, that's that physical at the line. Once, they, once, he, once, he's, he, once he pushes you, it's man strength against, against these wide receivers. And, and, and I'm sorry. Why, I played wide receiver uh, in high school. And – I would much rather play against a guy who plays off the line of scrimmage and lets me get into my route than a guy that puts his hands on me. Not only does it affect me in a time in the timing with that quarterback on that individual play, if I can't get off that jam, but it wears you out. Like wide receivers, most wide receivers aren't Isaiah Nayer size. They're not 6'3", 215. Uh, and if you're 5'10", 180 pounds, and you're seriously getting hit at the line of scrimmage every play, like within that first five yards, it takes a toll. You're not going to run as fast. 
uh, you're, you're, you're going to try to, and I know Brendan Marion will teach you about a step, B step, C step, and how to get off the line of scrimmage with, with your quickness and your, in your first, your jab steps. Uh, but, but Jalen Gibbo has reach and, and he's, he's a different kind of guy. Like I said, it, and it wears on you to, to, to have to go against a defensive back who puts their hands on you, uh, every play versus a guy who's playing off coverage and, and gives you the benefit of, of getting into your route. It just, and it, it, it just screws the whole, like I say, the, the, the quarterback and, and receiver timing and they can't get the ball out of, out of their hands and just routes. They run the route short. They, they, they bend them off when they're supposed to be at 12. They're now at 15 where, and, and it just, it just messes everything up. They're too close to the, to the other receivers in the route tree. It, I love that brand of football. Uh, Give me press corners. Yeah. So, really, D-Train said the starters for me are Jamison Watts, Baron Cook, Crawford. So, right now, I think they got Jamison Watts, Jamison Watts, Baron Thompson. Or, yeah, no, it's Jamison Watts, Baron Cook, and then Thompson, you know, in, in front of uh, Keaton Crawford. Currently, as it sits, I think, going into fall camp. Uh, It'll change so we'll, in two weeks. It'll it will. change in two weeks. Steve, you know, Steve Sarkeesian's not – I don't know if he's not excited about the defensive backs. He said it today. There's they asked him three places where he's concerned. One of them being the offensive line. Number two being the defensive backs, and the other ones being the special teams guys. You know, because you don't know what you're getting in those special teams guys. I just don't know if if he's if he if he doesn't feel good about the defensive backs. I don't think that's it. I just don't think he knows who those five starters are. You know, now and who they could be at the end of the, end of fall. But they're going against some hella wide receivers, man. I can't see. That's the thing about this defensive backs, right? Is that you're going against the best wide receivers you're going to see the entire year. Maybe outside yeah. of maybe what Alabama has. And I don't even know if Alabama's wide receivers are on the same level as yours are. But they're going to see the best wide receivers. If they can't, I, they're going to see the best wide receivers on the football field in the fall than what they're going to see the entire year. I believe that. And, and I and I believe he has his six or seven guys that are competing for those jobs. Uh, it's just going to be, again, these guys are all versatile. They've all played all over the place. When you talked about Anthony Cook, Keaton Crawford, like they've all, Jade Barron, they've all played all over the place. Um, and they can all cover. Uh, so, and that's what you want is a defensive backfield that can cover. And you want linebackers that can cover. Because uh, somebody asked about Demo. A second ago, if you pull that one up, were they going to try him on the edge? Yeah, he's going to get looks. He's going to be lined up behind the, the nose guard. He's going to be in the A-gap. He's going to be on the edge. He's going to be stand-up linebacker. They're going to put him in a, in a ton of different positions. And like I told David or David Bender the other day, is I hope they walk him up late. I hope they show him as a stand-up guy and, and walk him down the line of scrimmage late uh, a lot of times to disguise him. Don't don't line him up on the edge from, from, from go. Uh, slide that defense. Slide that defense up front. Let him walk down. And make them have to account for him late, like like late in their pre snap uh, recognition, and have to account for him. Uh, but now you'll see him all over the place. He's not going to play primarily. He's not going to. He's probably going to get around. If, let's just say there's he plays sixty snaps in a game. You're probably going to see him probably forty twenty uh, would be my projection. But but it's going to be down and distance dependent. Uh, wherever they think the weaknesses on the offensive line. Uh, if they think they can exploit certain matchups, uh, but he's gonna he's gonna be all over the field uh, trying to make plays in, in whatever capacity he can. I, I think they feel comfortable doing that, and uh, and there's a couple of reasons why. I think they feel real comfortable where Jalen Ford was at the end of the year going into spring, right? I think they feel really comfortable. I think David Benda is another guy they feel really comfortable with. But today, Sark was glowing about Tucker. He was glowing, yeah. like he said, "You don't understand." If you were to look at this guy and you were to see his stature, right, 5'10", 215 pounds, I think is what he was, then you're kind of just going to blow him off. But he does everything right. He's intelligent. He knows. They said the best thing about it, at that size, he knows how to shed blocks and he knows how to stop the run. And that's what we need, somebody that knows how to fill the hole and stop the run. But they said at the same time, he's good at pass rush and he can he, he can cover. He can cover. If need be, he can draw back and cover. So he I does, think – go ahead. No, he does what a running back does he makes himself small in the hole like i watched this film he, he's very instinctive and he makes himself small and, and like you say not necessarily shed blocks but dodges blocks and gets to the ball carrier in whatever ways he can uh but yeah no he's 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 definitely impressive and they they expect him to contribute um 
Haven't had a whole lot of success with bringing linebackers in the transfer portal again, but there was, there's four or five. Uh, Devin Richards is still in the program, so we'll see what he does. But, um, I mean, one of the guys they brought in last year, uh, Ben Davis, was the sack leader, unfortunately, with two and a half sacks. Um, but we'll, we'll see what D- – they believe in him. Uh, like I said, I watch his film and, and believe he, he brings a lot to the football team instinctually. And, and like you said, if he can, if he can just tackle, uh, if the if the defensive line could keep blockers off of him, he could shed the other ones and, and make tackles. That's what we need. The guy on the screen right here, bring Mo Blackwell to the linebacker. This guy on the screen right here, he is your tackler. Like in spring game, you 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 figured guys would kind of like just just back up a little bit, not not bring the wood that you know to go out there and and and, and hunt people down. The Mo Blackwell, I actually went back and watched the spring game the other day. Mo Blackwell tried to take Xavier Worthy's head off, and then turned around oh, and yeah. did it to, and then tried to do it to Billingsley, and then it, it just, and then he did it to, uh, I think Keela Robinson. I think it was Keela Robinson, if I'm not mistaken, one of those running backs. This dude's a missile, and I was, I called you, I called you that the night after I watched the spring game, right? And I said, this guy, you bring in a linebacker, I'm not sure, but if you teach him how to cover, this is one of those guys that. We've been missing, and that's a defensive back that is a sure tackler. But he played so to linebacker. Me, yeah, huh? He played, he played linebacker. Saying, and played linebacker, Martin, and they yeah. made him a safety. Made him a safety. Yeah. So yeah. if you you could literally turn this guy into a one of those safeties that is a sure tackler that you could bring down by the line, like like they're trying to do with Cook now, right now, because they're trying to play press coverage, which will allow that safety, that extra safety, to pay, play in the box more to stop the run. Mo Blackwell's your guy for that dude. Yeah, I, I, I just. I think the sky's the limit. We'll kind of see where it goes, but I he's a he reminds me of Ronnie Lott. You know what I'm saying? Like that's a lot. That that's a lot. No, I, I really appreciate his game. And like you said, he he will attack. I, I a lot of guys like to launch, right? A lot of guys like, this is our like him. Yeah. It, that's that's what I'm saying. I, I just worry about how BJ came as a five star from Angleton. And and he liked to knock people's heads off and end up ripping both shoulders. And and somebody talked about him a little bit earlier, five stars transferring out of the program. By the time BJ Froster left this program, he wasn't a five star athlete. And it wasn't because he couldn't play ball. It was because he was a shell of himself because he ripped two shoulders while he was here at the University of Texas. And I hope he does very well at Sam Houston. Uh he's been one of my when that class came out, he was my favorite. Uh him and DeMarvin Overshone, like Caden Stearns, Anthony Cook, uh Jalen Green. Uh I really like them a lot, but my two guys coming into that class were were the were the safeties. Uh, Demarby Novashon impressed me at the Under Armour All American game. I always thought he had the ability to play linebacker. Said it back then. Said it when this channel was very early, uh, before he moved. And then the other guy was 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 uh, B J Foster. I've loved his game, but but he wasn't the same player after the injuries. Somebody wants to talk about the kicker and the punter. I think we already covered it. We did cover kicker punter, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's, so there's, it's up in the air at this particular point. So, uh, I think that that Isaac Pearson more likely is going to be a punter. It's what it sounds like. They say, you know, Jeff Banks said he's going to wear, wear him out, wear himself out by the end of the season. He said, if you're driving up five thirty five, and you look up at every hour of the day, you see a punt going up in there because Isaac Pearson's out there practicing. And he's like, I got to teach him how to not practice as much and be more efficient, and effective, so he's not out there burning his leg out. So, I think Isaac Pearson is going to be your punter. I think. The kickers, the, the the field goal kicker and the kicker, you know, kickoff specialist, whatever. I think they're 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 probably still up in the air, but we'll kind of see where it goes from here, man. Obviously, it's it's a, it's it's important that that you know. I think sometimes we we on offense and on defense, but your special teams, you know, could be three points from winning you a game in the Red River rivalry. Uh, you know, um, at any particular point, we hope it's not to that point. Jeremy said, I'd rather score, you know, seven points than, than, than three points. And that's where I think we're all at. But at the same time, that, that kicker is going to be necessary at some point during the season to, to finish out, a, to finish out a half or, or, or whatever, whatever it may be. So they just don't yeah. think they, I, I didn't see the comment. They just don't think they have the, uh, the leg to kick long field goals. Is that, is that the sentiment that you got from the answer? There's just not trust there right now. I think I there's no trust. People, but there's no trust. There's no trust because they really haven't played in front of anybody other than the spring game. But I think that's the way all kickers start off. Dicker the kicker didn't just come out and hundred thousand fans were out there screaming at him. He's kicking field goals. 
I think it's something. I think that's to the way every new starter has to starter be looked at, regardless being, of the position. Yeah. But again, their their thoughts are again, if we're in fourth and three, we may think about going for it versus kicking a forty five yard field goal when we have a uh, somebody that hasn't kicked field goals in college and maybe worked themselves up to it. And I think somebody said it earlier that I think the best time to do that is, and it's going to be hard to do it, is when you're playing a team like ULM where you're going to score a whole bunch of touchdowns. I don't think you stop a drive on purpose to allow the guy to kick a field goal in DKR. Hmm. So I, I, no. I just don't think that's a thing. So if they're going to have to happen when they come, you know, and they're going to have to make that decision. Do we go for it or we let them kick the, the ball? That's what the, that's what the sentiment was today that they got to, they got to treat these kickers different than what they did Dicker the kicker because you had him for so long and he had been in big games before kicking field goals. And he was a freshman starter. If I'm not mistaken, I think he started all four, four years at UT. So you've had, and the last two years, I think he he punted and kicked off as well. Like that was a, that was a a blessing that that the University of Texas had that they really didn't have. And he wasn't always. I mean, he didn't hit every kick that he that he made, but you felt pretty confident when he went out there that he was going to do his job. So, uh, Abel here, Brooks does Brooks get four hundred rushing yards this year? He could. Um, it, it, you got to let me know. If he was to get five carries per game, let's just say he got five carries per game, uh, five times 12 is, is 60 carries. He'd have to average somewhere around eight and a half yards per carry, seven and a half yards per carry. Um, to do that, it, it depends on his workload. Are we, are we, are, do we have a couple of blowouts so we can get him the game to play two quarters? That'd be great. Uh, you gotta, I got to know if, if I'm praying Rojan and Bijan and Roshan stay healthy. And these are all just, you know, third string carries. And you're working Keelan out of the backfield and you're letting him play on special teams. Or, um, because I, I think if you're talking Keelan Robinson's ability to play running back and, and Jonathan Brooks, a little bit like you were talking about earlier, with guys on the same level and guys that have, have both been productive when they've been in the ball game, you might see, you know, two, two, four go ahead of seven on the depth chart as a running back. And then you see, might see, you know, Keelan Robinson playing a little bit of slot and and helping out on special teams a little bit more. Um, but it, it should be interesting. I, I just have to know what the injury situation in front of him was and how many blowouts we really had. But he's definitely capable. Uh, but, again, if he got, let's just say, 60, 60 carries, uh, he'd need like seven and a half yards per carry to, to, to get that done. I don't think he's got 60 carries in him unless you got quite a few blowouts. He would have to come in, like you said, he have to come in in the third, fourth quarter and get a bunch of those. You know, obviously, you got three guys in front of you. He's sitting at number four, and then Jaden Blue is sitting at number five. It wouldn't surprise me if Jaden Blue didn't get some time too to split some carries as well during, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, with Hell Keelan Robinson and Jonathan Brooks. So you got a problem, like like Steve Sarkeesian had said today, man. You, I've been on teams where you had one person you were trying to figure out how to get them the ball, and we're 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 in a good place right now because you probably got ten guys that that you can put on the field at any given time and you can you can just toss the ball around. And he said, I'm not worried about individual awards, team success. You get team success. After team success comes individual awards if you have team success. Um, and, and he said that. He said, uh, you were talking about number four wide receiver. Hell, it's funny because who is your fourth wide receiver? Is it a Jai Hall? Tariq Milton? Brennan Thompson? Troy Amir? You know what I'm saying? So who's your fourth guy, man? I Again, Ajay Hall, Troy Mary, and um, Tariq Milton. No, 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 no. My other 6'3 wide receiver. Uh, oh, oh, Isaiah Nair. Nair. Isaiah Nair. They're all the same. They're all the same. 6'3, you know, I think Nair's a little bigger than them in size. Uh, I think O'Meary, I think O'Meary and Nair are probably closer to size than what I think Ajay Hall is. I think he's 6'3, 184. Yeah, he's um, a so those, I think those are your ex guys, man. And then, uh, as you would look at it, but who knows? And Steve Sarkeesian's offense, man, he just lines up people all over the place. You know what I'm saying? You'll have an X playing Y and then a Y playing an X, and then you'll have Billingsley out there playing the X. I think Billingsley's your other X as well at freaking six foot four, 219. So good problem to have, man. Like I said, yeah. the offensive line could play good to average. You may probably have top three offense in the country. And, and like I said, JT Sanders is just a, watching his film back at Den Ryan as we did the the tight end. Uh, he's six four and a half, two hundred and thirty five pounds, very athletic, can go up and get the football. So not just the receiver position, but but at tight end as well. I think 
again, no knock on Cade Brewer and Jared Wiley, but I think Jaleel Billingsley and Jatavion Sanders is a, is a pretty good upgrade. Um, but we'll see. Again, they, they, they kick it off in a, in a little over 30 days. Yeah, Greg I saw Lane. that. Yeah. That's, why, that's why I kind <laughs> of brought it up. Because, Go ahead. And, and they're going to do multiple things with, with, with Will Anderson. And, and we're going to have to contend with Alabama's ability to game plan too because I just don't think he's going to be lined up on the same side every play. They're going to move him around. He's going to stand up. He's going to go flip-flop from side to side. They're going to bring him inside. They're going to look for matchups just like we were talking about a little bit earlier with DeMarvin Overshone. Um, and I and I, I think I asked Rod this, and, and it's got to be versatile. You're going to have two backs in the backfield. You're going to chip them with a running back. Uh, you're going to run to his side to try to wear him out in the run game. You're going to do a lot of different things. It's not going to be JT Sanders' job alone against Will Anderson. Uh, you're going to have a tackle along with JT and and probably – probably a running back to his side when JT split out. And, and But the problem is with Alabama is they got another dog on the other side of the line of scrimmage that you got to account for too. Uh, so they're going to do a lot of different things. It's not just – it's it's not going to be relying on JT Sanders to block Will Anderson for, for a whole football game. Mark Leppard, everybody's trying to get rid of PK in the season they haven't started yet. These are damn comments we get like uh... – Around December, post game. January time, like no yeah. post game, and then December into January, we start talking about people being on the hot seat. You hope not. Again, this is the problem. You bring in a defensive coordinator, you fire a defensive coordinator who brings in a different scheme, and then you're starting over again. You, again, you got to give these guys time. If you don't give them time, then we're going to be back in this same situation over and over and over again. I say the only way that happens if it's a disaster again this year, you pay. Uh, you pay. Gary Patterson, whatever he wants to stay in Austin, and you just bring him on board and you try to bring him, be, have him be your defense coordinator. But other than that, man, everybody needs to give PK a shot this year. He's getting his guys in. The ones he wants in, if he, if he doesn't do what he needs to with his guys over the next couple of years, then we start talking about getting rid of, uh, of Pete Kwiatkowski, man. But I, this whole we need to fire Pete Kwiatkowski, I think, started – it, this should have happened, you know, I think it probably did at the end of last year, but I think a lot of it got brought back up again when you start missing guys like Anthony Hill and, and Colton Bassett, Vosick and, and, and guys like Shelby to USC. So we'll see. It's great conversation tonight. Like we intended on talking about a lot of coaches comments, but, but it, it turned defense, it turned scheme, it turned uh player uh, analysis and, and position you know, where is where are folks going to end up on the two deep at the end of fall? Uh, we've covered a lot uh, tonight, and it's been a lot of fun. Uh, Texas football. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Robert Muhammad, are the Texas football talk game previews going to be on Thursday? Yeah. So that that's our that's our idea. They're going to be on Thursdays. Uh, I think I start school August 22nd. And usually we, we and Jeremy's been really good about this is we, we kind of do our shows based around when when stuff is due. Uh, for my courses, um, but I think it's they're not short courses. They're actually I'm going from four weeks to to, to you know re, to actual 15 week semester courses. So I don't think it's going to be as is crazy. Um, but yeah, Thursdays is going to be our our you know go ahead, Jeremy. You know, no, no, go ahead, finish. I was going to be our schedule real quick. It's going to be our our preview preview shows. Yep. Yeah, so I'm thinking probably Clint Clint likes to do a, a live like this after the the press conference on Monday. Uh, so probably a live on Monday, a pregame show on Thursday because we'll be under the Friday night lights on Friday traveling. I'll be traveling Central Texas. And then for half the football season, I'll be down in San Antonio with Clint. So we'll probably be traveling uh, the San Antonio area, catching high school games on Friday night. Then, of course, Saturday, uh, we'll have the in-game chats for the Inner Circle members. So we'll have the we'll have the – the the station channel up uh we'll be you know commenting back and forth during the game uh for those guys who join the inner circle and then probably 15 minutes post game we'll we'll throw a post game um uh show up and and, and be live on on air with the mics and the cameras and all that stuff but the two games that i'm going to be live on air with the mics and the cameras uh for the inner circle members are going to be for oklahoma and alabama uh, that's the plan so we'll have the the game streaming and then uh we'll be you know converse in conversation uh with those two big games of the year so please join the inner circle uh, be a part of those game day uh, atmosphere with your other brothers that, that follow texas football talk yeah absolutely man been on here for an hour and nine minutes tonight it was kind of thrown together you know 
I, I told Jeremy he, he didn't get home till probably 30 minutes before we did the show tonight. I, I talked to him this morning. I talked to him, about, I think, lunchtime. I said, hey, man, do you, do you want to do a show? They did three press conferences today. And, um, you know, it's getting really exciting, man. Like I said, it's it's football time in America. Uh, so college football is right around the corner. So um, probably not going to go to any games. I know Abel is asking if we're going to go into games this year. I don't think it's going to be a, a – possible to, to go to any games we'll let you know if we if we wind up doing it we like kind of like doing this you know we like doing the pre-games i mean we like doing the the post-game stuff after the games and, and a lot of that stuff's hard if we wind up going to the games to me i'm not gonna lie to you i'm more of a hey sit in the house and, and watch it from my my own living room i can see more of the game than when i'm in the stands it's hard to pay attention to what's going on um and do a post game after that uh but you know it's kind of where we're at but we're, we're it's getting exciting and, and we're here and we'll kind of uh did I say ancestors? What did I say? No, no, I said it. I said, uh, uh, join us with your other brothers at <laughs> Texas Football Talk. Queenie, you know, you know you're our sister out there. Yeah, I misspoke, and I knew it after I said it. Uh, but our demographics are kind of, like I can tell you, our, our, our analytics say that we're, what, 98.9% male and 1.1% female. So they're accounting for you on the analytics there, Queenie. And I'm sure there's a couple of others out here that don't comment, but – but we're thinking about you. Really appreciate you. You support Wendy KJ. Show. I think I think she watches as well. Not sure if she's on okay. tonight, but I think she watches as well. So yeah, it, it's one of those things. He apologizes. All right, sorry about that. I don't know what you said. I don't know what popped up. But we enjoy each and every one of y'all. We really, really do appreciate y'all. I think we're gonna get it off now. Uh, please hit that like button. There's you know 130, 120 people worth watching now. Please hit that like button before y'all get off of here. If you have not subscribed, please hit that that subscribe button. Me and Jeremy are trying to get to, to 4,000 subscribers by the by the first game, which is a tough task. Jeremy said it's 100. It's 100 subscribers per a week. week. That is rough. That's really, really tough. So if you have not subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. Uh, you can find us on Facebook at Texas Football Talk, on Instagram at Texas Football Talk. And I promise you this, we are very, very active on Twitter. If it's not me, it's Jeremy. Jeremy's been really, really, really active on Twitter lately. So um, you can definitely reach us at, at uh, on Twitter at TX Football Talk. Thank you for listening. As always, y'all have a wonderful rest of your week. Hook them. Hook them.